Hello. In this presentation, I'd like you to, to take away some strategies that you can use to work more effectively with the interpreter and some teaching strategies that you could adjust that would allow the student to be a very active participant in your classroom. And I'd like to offer you some tips for creating a relationship with the particular uh, student that you're serving who's deaf. I think the first step that I alluded to in the previous video clip is that it would be very, very helpful if you prepared with the interpreter. And so by preparation, that means sharing materials, sharing lesson plans, giving a heads up on the kinds of video clips that you're using. So anything that can help them understand the content and then how you're going to be delivering it. But also then to be able to talk about what your goals are. So sometimes when I uh, have watched reading aloud activities in, in uh, kindergarten classes, for example. I know that the teacher's goal is to expose the student to print literacy through the book, and I know there's some interaction that has to go on, and I know that there are some predicting skills and some repetition that the deaf students and the hearing students are supposed to engage in. But if I, as the interpreter, don't know that, I may inadvertently choose to interpret the activity as uh, an explicit activity that doesn't allow the student the same opportunities for thinking and responding as the hearing students are. So really helpful for me to know what you're doing in this particular lesson. So my goal today is to do this. My goal today is to do this. What I'm trying to accomplish is this. And that doesn't take very long, but even just giving the, the interpreter a heads up on that is very, very helpful. The end of class, being able to say in the next class, what I hope to be able to get to is this. Have a look at this section of the, of the textbook. I'll put a PowerPoint up in, the, uh, in our internal website. You can look at that. I'm going to have the students look at a number of websites. They're going to have, be in small groups. We'll have to think about how that's managed. So anything that helps them prepare is a really helpful thing. Just because interpreters have uh, interpreted in educational settings for a long period of time doesn't mean that they've got a handle on the content. So just as the curriculum changes for hearing students, our understanding of it as teachers changes and it has to change for interpreters as well. So the prep is the first uh, big step. One of the other strategies that I think is helpful for deaf students is to think about pre-teaching. I said earlier in video clips that many of the students coming to the inclusive environment, working in a mediated environment, will not have the same language skills that the hearing students do. So they're already coming at a disadvantage. They don't share the same language that's being used in the classroom for instruction, and they don't share the same experiential level or the same language levels as your hearing students. So some pre-teaching of the concepts between the interpreter and the deaf student can be a very, very helpful thing. That can be managed by you, so it may be that you have a moment to do some pre-teaching. It may be that you figure out a list of the, of the concepts and identify that handout, provide it to the interpreter and the family. It may that be that that's done peer-to-peer. -peer. So it may be that you've got a very nice relationship between the deaf student and a, a strong student in the classroom where that can be peer-to-peer -peer teaching that's mediated with an interpreter. It might be a situation where if a family is accessing tutoring support, whether that's uh, tutoring locally or tutoring via distance with a deaf person or a person who can use sign language, that you provide again the pre-teaching concepts back to the family so that they can give them to the tutors or that the family is going to do that themselves. But that pre-teaching can be a really wonderful cognitive support for the deaf learners that also then allows them to compensate for how quickly the interpretation is going to come at them. Because you're moving through the content quickly, the work is simultaneous, the interpreters are signing just as quickly as you are speaking. And so anything that we can do to help reduce the cognitive load for the deaf student who has to access the information through interpretation is helpful. So pre-teaching is one of those things that can be useful. I think also when you're thinking about prepping and your conversations with the interpreter, if you can invite them to ask questions, because by asking questions, they'll activate what they know about the subject and what they know about the teaching process, and so we're acting, activating their metacognitive abilities as well. But it'll also be diagnostic for you because through their questions, I think you'll get a sense of what they really understand and the places that you need to pay attention to because, again, if the interpreters don't understand it, what the student gets will be very different than what you intended. So we have to work on that common frame of reference between you and them.
If you are thinking about using videos, and many of us use all kinds of media in our classrooms today, if you're thinking about a YouTube video, can you click the closed caption button? Many of the videos are auto captioned, and I'm not suggesting that that's perfect captioning or perfect access, but it can be one other level of support that allows the deaf student then to be able to watch the video with a more close range of looking at the captions. So if that's available, use it. And uh, if you're going to use other material that is uh, available, public uh, broadcasting, that kind of thing, look for uh, captioning on it because again, the captioning will not only support the deaf student, but it's one other way of accessing information for other students. So it's just good teaching practices. Because if it's not captioned, what happens is that the interpreter then has to interpret that entire video. What happens then is that the student has to make a choice. Watch the interpreter or watch the video because it's highly unlikely that they can do both. But what happens is that students do try to do both and it means that they get some of the video and some of the content. Some of the video, some of the content. So again, some teachers also then make sure that those sites are available for the student to have another look at at a later time. I said in a previous video that teacher intent informs interpreting and that is one of the most critical factors that we're finding across the board in terms of analyzing the interpreting performance of, of people working in classrooms like yours. And so if you know the purpose behind your questions, if you understand what you are doing, if the interpreter can understand it in the same way, then they have a much better schema for understanding how to put that into interpreting. So that shared context has to be there in order for us to get away from the word side equivalent and get, a, get into the teaching function that uh, allows for academic engagement. A couple more words about prep. Uh, sometimes when I work with interpreters, what they understand prep to be is that I just have to read it. And so I see them reading the textbook or I see them reading the handout for next week's class. And while that can be helpful, it's not as helpful as doing active preparation. The active reading for me is what we would define as passive preparation for interpreting. Active preparation means that I actually look at that content, maybe do a discourse map of it or a content map, and then I try and produce it in American Sign Language. And by producing it in American Sign Language, I can see, oh, I don't have concepts for that. I don't know how deaf people typically talk about that in chemistry. I don't know how uh, deaf people talk about political systems and democracy versus some other systems. I don't know what socialism looks like in ASL, and yet deaf people do talk about those things. So how do I acquire that language if I don't know that that's the language I need? So I want them to actively par uh, participate in the prep. And then I want them to have access to resources. And so some of the schools that I think are very, very effective are schools that allow for tutoring of their interpreters, knowing that the interpreters are not likely to have the sign language necessary to convey your academic content. So they're accessing uh, teachers of the deaf, they're accessing language support workers who are deaf themselves, who can talk about how do deaf people talk about this in natural language. That boosts their language use and allows them then to be much better prepared for the work that they're going to do for you. That also then feeds into the supervision of the interpreter that I spoke about in an earlier clip as well too, is that it's pretty clear that interpreters need to be supervised by other interpreters. And so it may be that your school has to access some consulting support in order to help interpreters learn how to more actively prepare. pause there and then when I come back I'll talk a little bit about how you can do an audit in your classroom for determining whether the environment can be interpreted, can be interpreted with modification, or really can't be interpreted. Thanks.